Hi, it's Jan Beta, and I nearly completely forgot that I had a third Commodore 64 in the Aldi version that I got hold of when I made my Aldi 64 video a while back. Um, this one isn't working at all. <laughs> and I, I did some work on it. Uh, I think I, I filmed a bit of it, but didn't really get anywhere. So I completely put that aside and worked on something else. And I thought it would be time to make another Commodore 64 video anyway, so um, I just found this uh, in my stash of broken machines uh, to the right here. And yeah, let's have a look. So as I said, I had this open before and uh, know what it looks like and it doesn't look too bad uh, in this state it's in. I'm gonna show you in a second. Just let me show you briefly what it does when it uh, is turned on. So it's hooked up to the, the video converter there. And it produces an output signal, so the, the converter um, realizes there is a signal connected, but it gives me a black screen. Uh, so this is a classic blank screen Commodore 64. Uh, the Aldi version that has an early revision of the um, short board that was used in later Commodore 64 models. So yeah, let's take a look. So I already had this open. Let's disconnect the cables here. And uh, yeah, as you can see, I already removed the RF shield. I'm just gonna remove the board completely from the case. Remove the keyboard. should wear my wrist strap so I don't zap anything additionally so here we go so here's where we're at and I actually replaced this uh, 470 microfarad capacitor because it was blown actually so these are for smoothing uh, the voltage uh, the 9 volts coming from the uh, power supply that are uh, rectified with this bridge rectifier and uh, used for for some voltages that are needed across the board here uh, for the tape port and stuff like that. And uh, there might have been an over, over voltage or something like that uh, on the 9 volts, which I don't really know. I don't see it happen a lot. Maybe somebody did something weird with this machine. Um, don't see the smoothing capacitors get blown a lot but yeah that's what happened obviously I don't know what happened to this machine I, I think as we have a video out uh, of some sort at least a signal let's try a dead test card Whoa. And we still got a blank screen, black screen. But the dead test card takes a while to, to set in, usually. But in this case, it doesn't really seem to do anything. No, nothing. Another thing that has been done to this board by the previous owner, uh, allegedly, is that the RAM chips have been uh, replaced. So I don't know if these work really, but they're in there. And uh, yeah, I don't really know if, if they did a good job or if they shorted out anything or something like that. Uh, I think we should check the voltages on the board so we can be sure that all the voltages are correct. Okay, here should be the AC voltage, which is a bit high on my homemade power supply, but it's fine. Yes, yeah, that's normal. And this is a bit low actually. So let's see if the, the ICs get the right voltages. So this should be 5 volts, I guess. Yep. This should be 9 volts, which it is. This should be 5 volts. This is a bit low. The 5 volts seem to be a little bit low, actually. Maybe it's 
something is shorted somewhere. So that's a bit low really. It should be a little bit like 5.1 volts or so usually. That's really a tiny bit low. The supply voltage. Hmm. So I suspect there's something going on there with maybe a short or something. So the ICs get warm actually. So I think I'm, I'm going to have a look at the voltages with the scope, I guess. So let's, let's see. Just turning the Commodore 64 on. And I'm connecting my probe to various points on the board where there should be 5 volts. So okay, this is what the supply voltage for a chip looks like. 5 volts. This is like set to 2 volts per division. So this is uh, a bit lower than 5 volts. That's exactly what it should look like. So it seems that there's activity on the ICs as well. Okay, checking the pins on the CPU, which is the 8500. This is the reset line, which should be high when the system is running. It should go high after a couple of seconds or like two seconds or something. Look at, okay, we're looking at the address lines. These are the address lines and there is activity on them. There's activity, there's activity, there's activity. There's some activity. Let's look at the data lines, which are uh, pin 20, no, pin 24 to pin 37, really. 37 is the data line zero. Okay, and there's nothing on the data lines. There's something, there's something. Okay, the, so the signals on the data lines are either not pres present or stuck high. So I guess there's something going on in the bus there. Maybe. Uh, either it's the processor itself that's gone, or maybe the RAM that has been replaced. I still kind of suspect there's something wrong with the processor at this point, because uh, it is quite a common fault actually. Okay, there should be, let's, let's check the clock, it should be on pin 18, it should be 24, 23, 22, 24, 28, 18, there should be a clock, which it is. Let's look at the data lines. There's activity on the data lines. There's nothing going on there. The address lines have a signal. That's a bit weak. So, I think it might be the processor. I'm just going to uh, desolder the processor, I guess. And put in a known working one. And it also gets pretty warm, which is unusual, especially as this is not running anything. Yeah. Let's try that. I think, I have a feeling that this might be faulty. This might be the only thing that's faulty there. This might have gotten some overvoltage at some point. And these um, processors are pretty prone to failure. In general, I'm adding some flux. Let's see if we can the right chip. Yes, some flux. Because flux always helps with soldering and with desoldering. So um, there's a couple of pins that I didn't get out. 
but uh, I'm just going to add some more solder to them, some fresh solder because it has some uh, fresh flux in it and will get better uh, heat transfer with some new flux that we're going to flow in there. A couple of pins, just going to redo them. Most of them, I think, are fine. Already loose. Let's see. These newer Commodore 64 boards are way harder to solder on than the old ones, actually. So, this one maybe. Okay, that works beautifully. Okay, I think I have most of them loose now. Let's see. Just going in with this sputter that I have lying around. And I'm just wiggling them a bit to get the last remaining bits that hold them in off there. Oh. Okay. We don't seem to have damaged any traces. <laughs> That's good. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, doesn't look too bad. So what I'm going to do now is to um, swap the chip we just desoldered into a working Commodore 64. Well, this is an old one, but the um, 8500 is fully compatible with the 6510. It's just another manufacturing process, so these are interchangeable um, one way or the other. So just gonna swap this in really quickly into this one here. This this is as we've seen in the previous videos about the Black Beauty Commodore 64. I'm gonna link them in here. Uh, this is nearly all socketed, so it's pretty convenient. Just gonna get the old one out there and swap in the new one. And see, that really was the culprit. Okay, testing the desoldered chip in this um, Black Beauty Commodore 64. Ah, and it works. So the processor seems to be fine. I'm just soldering a socket in the board so we can replace it to our liking later. So I uh, removed the SID chip and it still gives me the same black screen. So I am going to check the uh, VIC-2 chip and the little 8701 clock chip. That's this one here. Um, both of those can give me um, a blank screen if they are shorted or not working correctly. Uh, this is the, the master clock really for the video out, so maybe there's something wrong there. Uh, otherwise there might be problems with the RAM chips uh, that are have been replaced in this machine and might also be the CIA or one of the little logic ICs there. Just going through Ray Carlson's troubleshooting guides which I highly recommend. I'm gonna link them in I'm basically linking those in below every Commodore 64 repair video because I refer to them so uh, frequently. Uh, they are really, really helpful. So I'm just gonna swap this chip into a working Commodore 64 C board uh, to see if it is working. Okay, let's test this Commodore 64 with the uh, VIC-2 from the broken one. Testing. Yep, perfectly fine. So this gets an okay. Let's test the little uh, clock chip there. Okay, testing with the uh, clock chip from the other machine there. Yep, perfectly okay. Okay. 
So I'm just going to put the original to the deck. We don't get much activity on the address lines, so it might be the input output single. Hmm. Maybe I should just disorder this one. The U1 can be responsible for a blank screen if it is shorted, and this gets quite hot on this one. So I guess I'm trying to disorder the, the CAA here, socketing it. If it was only the RAM, my dead test would do something, I guess. So it must be something else, really. It could be that the RAM is completely busted. That would be another possibility. I think I want to test the, the CA one first. It should probably replace the capacitors at some point, but uh, the voltages looked fine even in the scope, so I doubt that it has anything to do with that. Yes. Okay, I pulled in a socket <laughs> and hope for the best. And again, I'm testing the chip from the broken machine in a non working machine. So we're going to be able to see if the chip is broken. Okay, turning it on. Ah, okay, so we don't have a cursor. We don't have a cursor. So that chip is broken. All right, definitely broken. Thank you, Ray Carlson, for pointing out the shorted CIA can be the culprit. Let's try with a known working CA in the uh, broken C64. Okay, putting the known good one into the Commodore 64. I can leave out the SID for now because it's going to start up fine without the SID. If that was the fault. There might be multiple faults, of course, which always makes things a lot more difficult. Okay, fingers crossed this fixes this Commodore 64, which is the Aldi model, which is pretty nice, really. Okay, and it's exactly the same behavior. Hmm. Okay, so that's not good. Let's try if it takes the dead test cartridge now. Maybe it works a bit better. We can find out what the fault is. Come on. You can do it. Hmm. So that was promising. <laughs> The CAA was damaged, so I replaced it with this one. That is the known working one. Um, I'm also going to replace the second CAA because if this one's shorted, it might as well give us a blank screen. Uh, yeah, then it might also be the RAM. Well, it will be kind of handy to have all the ICs socketed on this one. Uh, for quick testing purposes, probably. So this is probably going to be my test Commodore 64 at some point. Uh, I'd just be happy to get it working again, really. So let's go on desoldering. I'm uh, a bit out of ideas, but 
yeah, I'm kind of blindly checking the chips here. The RAM could also be culprit. It could also be the 74 LS08 top here. It stays pretty cold. Yeah, as I said, maybe this got some serious over voltage at one point, so there might be numerous a number of issues. Somebody replaced the RAM, so I guess these are new RAM chips that, that are probably fine. So I'm just going to desolder the LS74 uh, 74 LS08 because I have some stock of those and it's easier to desolder than the CAA. Uh, although both might give us the blank screen that we have. Let's see which one it is. It's this one. U3, actually. So, this is U3. Let's put in a socket as well. Okay. Got the new chip in, let's test it. This is turning into quite a lengthy repair. I wasn't thinking that would be. But this machine, um, if you get a machine with, with some uh, over voltage stuff going on, there's often ever so much. And it's exactly the same. Oh no. Oh no. I'm just going to desolder the second CAA chip now. Uh, yeah, let's go. This is like a, a, a soldering tutorial, really. <laughs> let's see if it works without the CAA chip. Maybe that was shorted. should do something at least. Dun dun dun. Okay. RAM. Maybe the RAM is completely shot. I am going to try to, to put new capacitors in, I think. Uh, yeah. Maybe check the clock. So I don't have any spare RAM chips at the moment of the right kind, so I'm taking it from this board. <laughs> just want to briefly show you, show you this soldering here that the previous owner did. Uh, this doesn't work, and uh, as you can see the RF modulator has been ripped off. Uh, I, I'm using this as a spare board at the moment. Maybe I'm going to back uh, I'm going back to this at some point and trying to fix it, but not at this point. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just taking the ram, ch ram chips off there to, to see. I don't know if these work, uh, but it's worth a try, I guess. I don't have anything else planned for tonight. <laughs> And this gives me exactly nothing. So I'm a bit out of ideas at the moment, uh, but I'm not giving up yet. So with the new uh, old CIA in there, we're at least getting a better reading on the 5 volts. So I guess that's, that's close to normal, 5.1 or 5.0. Eight, seven, something. Okay, that's actually nine volt on the. That's a bit low. So the sit might be bored. Okay, maybe we'll take off the sit there. It's a stubborn one. It's still a blank screen, as before. Just the same. Uh, the voltages are better. Should work without the two um, uh, CIA chips and without the uh, SID chip. 
I'm getting confused here with the names. Uh, so, yeah. What I'm going to do now, it's pretty unlikely that the PLA is faulty, and this gets a bit warm. Usually if it is faulty, it stays uh, stone cold. So that's not the problem. Most likely that's not the problem. I am going to replace the capacitors regardless, because um, I would do it anyway. And, yeah. Otherwise, I'm pretty much out of ideas here. Hmm. That's an interesting one indeed. <laughs> Maybe one of the other logic chips has some issues. Maybe I'll... I checked the, the traces on the uh, RAM and they are connected to each other. So that's not, not going to be a problem. Okay. I'm replacing the capacitors uh, as a kind of uh, thing at do anyway. So So I double checked the connections on the RAM and they all seem to be there, so uh, there's nothing wrong there. The connections to the PLA are there, or the the super PLA. Um, the connections between the chips are there. I found one thing that bothers me. The DIN jack here, the audio video jack is cracked in this corner there can see it there. And also on the back side, this uh, connection is protruding to the inside of the board a bit more, so it probably won't make good contact. So I am going to replace this with a spare I'm going to salvage from the donor board. Okay, got the broken one out. Well, this isn't nice anyway, so it's probably a good idea to replace it. So here's my universal spares board, uh, which has like um, not worth repairing damage on the RAM and some other fault I can't quite pinpoint. Uh, so I couldn't get this back to working order, so I'm just using it for spares and I already salvaged quite some components as you can see. But our uh, DIN jack still on here so we're just going to salvage that one from this uh, they they all have the same footprint basically so I'm just going to desolder this from here so and as you can see it looks a tiny bit different uh, than the other one here the old one because it has uh, no metal shield on here. But that doesn't matter at all, I guess, for the function. Because the pins are identical. Except for it only has two ground pins instead of three, but they are connected together anyway. So, uh, yeah, that's gonna be alright. Unfortunately, we get the same result with the new DIN jack in there. But at least it's a proper uh, working DIN jack now. <laughs> that doesn't have any cracks. Just gonna get rid of the old one. So I'm checking the reset circuitry now. 
And the reset on the newer boards is uh, there's a little pulse generated by U23 as soon as the 5 volt rail reaches its uh, nominal voltage. So um, this is just, just a little circuit consisting of two um, diodes, a capacitor and this uh, chip that gives a little pulse. We're going to see in a second. Uh, on pin 6 and I think on another pin 2 pin 2 maybe can't remember but uh, pin 6 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 should give me a little pulse let's look at the scope ok so here's pin 6 of U23, which should give me a reset pulse if it works. Yep. And it was just... that's the pulse. <laughs> and then we can check on U22. Okay, so we switch it on. This is pin 2 on uh, U22. And this should stay high uh, after power on reset. So this is just... Yeah, this is just fine. So this should also go to the processor on pin 40. And there it is. Yeah, that's our reset circuitry. Seems to just switching off again, switching on again. This is um, probing the processor at pin 40, which is the reset line. And this just goes up and stays. So this is perfectly fine. I probed the reset line before, but I wasn't sure if I filmed it and wanted to explain in a bit, a bit more detail because it's pretty important. If this doesn't work, the whole system doesn't start up because it doesn't get the reset signal. And uh, yeah, the um, 7406, which is U22, and the U23, which is a 74LS14, um, yeah, they fail sometimes, so the, the whole system fails because of the little logic chips not working. So, um, probing the kernel, which is a uh, combined kernel and basic ROM on these newer Commodore 64s. Uh, on the old ones there were two separate chips for basic and uh, uh, kernel. And there are a lot of lines that are permanently high. Which is a bit suspicious. So it's not starting up properly. And there's no activity whatsoever going on. Let me show you the scope. So I'm sorry that I can't film the scope and the probing the chip at the same time. Uh, so let me show you. This just. Some of the some of the address lines are just stuck high, and there's no activity. Usually, this would have uh, some activity at least. So there's just nothing going on there. We have the same on the character ROM, which is the chip right uh, left to it. <laughs> So maybe there's something wrong there too. Yeah, so I think I want to try pulling the kernel and replacing it. Maybe that helps. A bit out of ideas. This gives me quite a headache. Maybe it's something I overlooked, but uh, the kernel is behaving suspicious. And as it so happens, I made a replacement uh, kernel and basic ROM ages ago when I was working on another Commodore 64. This is an EEPROM that I made. 
So, this should theoretically work if the kernel was the culprit, so let's see. Fingers crossed. Nope. See if we can get the get dead test to work now. Nope. So another thing to check is the clocks on the CPU. Uh, we check the reset line, which is high, which is fine. Um, there's a clock in on pin 1 and a clock out on pin 39. Uh, this is the 8500, which is the same pin out as the 6510. In fact, these are interchangeable. Um, so I'm going to measure pin 1, which is the clock input, and 39, which is the clock output of the CPU. So um, let's switch to the scope view. So one of the little sections is 2 volts now. Uh, this is pin 1, should be the clock input, which is absolutely, it's a pretty clean and good signal. Clock out, looks a bit rounded, yeah, but it's absolutely fine. Uh, reset line is high. So what I'm suspecting now to be faulty is this huge um, PLA chip, which usually is very robust. Um, these very rarely fail, but as this board, as it had the burst capacitor in the first place, it might have gotten some serious overvoltage, so I don't know how these chips react to serious overvoltage. Um, usually they take everything pretty lightly and they don't get hot and as the old um, PLA chips, yeah, but uh, in this case, this is nearly the only thing left, except for I overlooked something, but yeah, that may always be the case, of course, but I really suspect this because the um, data lines from the ROMs to the ROMs uh, from the PLA are very, they look strange, there's not much activity going on, and there should be, because the PLA basically um, is the, the heart that switches uh, activity from and to the chips. So, yeah, this possibly is broken. I ordered one. This is a 64-pin narrow pitch uh, IC, so <laughs> that's going to be fun desoldering. Uh, I hope to get this done in a way that I don't mess up the board. Uh, I'm going to put a socket in and I ordered a spare one. The, there are actually two versions of these large chips. This is the older version, 251715. Uh, let's see if this one is the newer version. Yes, it is. Uh, this is the 2525301. This one's made by Sharp, the other one is also made by Sharp, which you can see by the little S there, although this is MOS branded. Um, Yamaha made some of these, um, they are basically the same chip, only produced by a different manufacturer. Um, these have an integrated color RAM, this is a more recent board, this one still has a little dedicated RAM chip next to the big PLA, that's the, the hint, you can uh, see that this is an older board revision of the short Commodore 64 boards. The other one has it integrated in the large chip. So okay, I'm waiting on the spare here, so and then hopefully get this done. This is the last thing I suspected because all troubleshooting guides say this rarely fails. <laughs> I've seen Gadget UK um, replace one of these before, but I rarely ever saw somebody else do it, so this is the first for me too. This is the first time I desolder one of these. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the last resort. Hope it helps. Otherwise I'm just going to, uh, I don't know, scratch my head and try something else. Maybe get another Commodore 64. So I ordered a replacement uh, Super PLA and a socket for it. And it's literally just a day later and it arrived. It's the evening of the day. I uh, had to 
take the kid to bed so uh, this is where I'm at. I have to desolder this 64 pin uh, narrow pitch <laughs> I see because I think this is the faulty one uh, I check nearly everything else there might be something else I think I'm just going to do it now because uh, I very much suspect this thing to be the faulty chip okay fingers crossed this is going to work and uh, if it is going to work the desoldering process uh, is going to work nicely and it's going to fix the problem Okay, I got it out, and it's not too damaged. The pins are pretty flimsy compared to uh, the ones on uh, like 40 pin ICs or something like that. And I think I might have damaged one trace here, uh, this one here, but it can easily be bridged to here, I guess. Let's see if I really damaged that or if it's just. Uh, If it's just like flux residue or something. Okay, let's see. This should be connected to here, which it isn't anymore. Okay. And it should be connected to this point. Okay. So that's not connected anymore, but we can connect it back. No worries whatsoever. So I'm just cleaning up some of the uh, holes here, so I can put in the new socket easier later. Okay, I have to make one uh, little botch on the third pin there. I'm just going to take a picture of that so I can remember. Uh, the other contacts seem just fine. Which is not a bad ratio. <laughs> so, 64 pins. And I got 63 right. And the one's not that badly damaged. So, uh, okay, let me put this uh, monster of a socket in. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty neat. Looks great, actually. Yeah, but that doesn't look too bad. Okay, this one can get in there. Yep! And we're in. Nice. Okay, and I want to go from the third pin to this. Okay. So I marked my little uh, where I put the botch wire so I don't, I don't get the pins confused and stuff like that. So, Let's try and solder in the new socket, which should be the easier part. <laughs> there we go. Our little botch wire. Okay, definitely working. Now let's try and put our chip in. <laughs> okay, this isn't isn't trivial. 
I'm gonna guess if you get one band pin, you're going to try forever. Okay. Seems to be in. Not too bad. Whew, I guess it's time to try this thing. Cross your fingers, everybody. We'll see. Please work. Dope. Okay, poked around with the multimeter a bit more, and I found this. Uh, here's CR7, which is a diode. I can put this into uh, the beeper, and the diode is shorted in both directions, which shouldn't be the case. Um, also, in the diode tester mode, this should give me the forward voltage, and it's zero volts. So that's not good. Let's see what it is on a working board. So as you can see, this is not shorted. And the forward voltage is something like 0.7 volts. So the diode, even measured in circuit, is definitely dead. So let's desolder it and put in a new one. CR7 is a Zeno diode actually, which is responsible, among other parts, for the 9 volts on the board. Yay! So that's working. That's a good one. I salvaged from the board and lagging around. Okay, let's see what this does. Let's see if it does anything at all. It doesn't. It gives me a hum, so probably the voltages aren't right. Or something. Okay, it's a couple of days later, and in the meantime I caught a nasty cold again. You can probably hear it in my voice still. Uh, it's getting better, but I couldn't work um, on this for a couple of days. Uh, I replaced the little Zener diode that this is. Let me zoom in on that. I replaced the little Zener diode. This is a 9.6 volt Zener diode that's um, responsible for providing the 9 volt unregulated uh, to the rest of the board and uh, this was uh, shorted actually in the end. I believe it wasn't shorted in the first place but uh, this shorted out while I was testing this so it has been had been damaged at, at least that's my theory. Uh, I replaced this transistor here um, this is basically the 9 volt unreg uh, circuitry, the, the diode, this um, resist resistor uh, and the transistor. So that's providing the 9 volts, which are derived from the, um, in the end, from the 9 volt coming from the um, power supply, 9 volt AC that is rectified, and uh, this is converting it to 9 volts. It's basically the same as a voltage regulator, but in discrete uh, components. So the voltage on the 9 volt rail was a bit high. This capacitor, one of the capacitors was blown when I got the board. So I believe that uh, this got some really uh, nasty over voltage, maybe lightning strike or something like that. And a couple of ISTs were damaged. Uh, the one component, one component that is uh, provided with 9 volts from this little circuit is the SID chip. And in my case, I removed it now because the Commodore 64 should start up without the SID because I, um, I fear that it might get damaged otherwise. So um, while I'm testing this, I'm just removing it. 
And the other thing that is supplied by the 9 volt is uh, the RF modulator. So uh, my theory is that uh, this blue, while I was testing, it was damaged before, probably supplying the wrong voltages, probably there was an over voltage on the 9 volt rail at some point, maybe damaged the RF modulator. The signals I'm getting from the new PLA are much uh, more active and better than the ones I got before, so I suppose the PLA was broken too. What I want to check now is if I get a signal, a video signal on the VIC-2 chip, which is this one here, and if the signal is also supplied to the output, because um, the, the signal from the VIC-2 basically runs through the RF modulator, and if something shorts out in here, you won't get a signal on the, on the output the video out. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to scope the VIC-2 for signals and see if that provides a proper signal. And if that has a signal and the output doesn't have a signal, I'm going to replace the RF modulator because that's going to be faulty too. There's a lot of faulty chips on here and a lot of faulty components, so um, I might have to replace other stuff, but um, that's where I'm at at the moment, so let's see if that uh, gives me any clues about what's going wrong here. Okay, here's the pinout of the VIC-2 chip. This is actually the older version, the 6567, which is basically the same chip, but uh, this is uh, needs other supply voltages. I made a couple of videos about that before. We're going to scope pin 14 and 15. This is the color or the chroma and the um, brightness or the luma. This These should give us video signals. Um, yeah, let's see if we get signals out of the chip and if the signals are supplied also on the output jack, on the DIN jack here, where they should be. Uh, otherwise we have a shorted RF modulator or something uh, broken in the RF modulator. This is pin 14, this is our color signal. This is looks good. <laughs> and this is our let's check this. This is our um Luma signal. Which is our brightness signal. And there's something going on. And this little dot here that you can see blinking. Probably is the cursor. <laughs> so we probably have a working Commodore 64, but we don't have a picture output from the RF modulator. So we are going to replace the modulator. I think that might help. So we get a video output on the scope. I also checked with the um, dead test cartridge and we get the same video output with more activity there that we get with the working Commodore 64 board. But we don't get anything on the output, uh, we don't output anything on screen, so I suppose <coughs> there might be, it might really be the RF modulator. So here we are. It might just be a shorted capacitor or a diode or something like that. So let's see. So on the bottom. I wonder if it makes sense to just replace this with a good one. Um, I think I might do that. And then take a look at this later. Let's see if we can see anything. Maybe we, we can see a broken diode right away or something. So the diodes should give us forward voltage if we put this into diet, diode testing mode. Hmm. Can't see anything right away, so let's just put in another one, I guess, and see if that works. Okay, so here's another modulator. <coughs> let's see. Let's just hope this works. Okay, there we are. <coughs> uh, let's test this. It might just be the only fault that's left. So I went on and connected it to my 
real CRT monitor because I didn't get a real signal on my um, converter box anymore. Uh, I have the dead test inserted, so let's see if we get an output from it. Yes! There's a dead test. Let's see if it does anything. Yes, it does stuff. It does stuff. Yay! This might just be fixed. Let's see if it if it uh, runs through the test there. That would be great. That would be amazing. <sighs> yeah, and that, except for the sound test, which obviously doesn't work because there's no uh, SID in there at the moment. It did work, in fact. This seems to work fine now. <laughs> Whew. Let's connect it to the color monitor and see if it if it runs without the dead test. Okay, let's let's first try to run it without the dead test and let's see. Nope. So we also have a broken kernel, which is about the only thing I didn't check. Okay. Or we have something else broken that the dead test doesn't show me. Okay, let's put in another kernel. I think I have a, a burned kernel here. That might just work. I don't know. Let's see. Maybe it works, maybe it won't. Checking the burnt kernel on an EEPROM. Nope. No dice. Okay, the Doctor 64 cartridge works partially. It fails the RAM test, interestingly. Okay. Okay, so maybe we have some RAM problems too, still. <laughs> Man, but at least we're we're onto something. I think the the RAM might be broken, so I'm going to replace the RAM again with the one that the person who worked on this before put in there. Let's see, maybe that helps. Maybe there's something else rotten. Okay, new RAM. Okay, fails at the same point. Let's try another diagnostics card. <laughs> okay, so it passes the dead test, which is a very good sign. Uh, but I still don't get a picture, I think, without the cartridge. Let's see. Sound test doesn't work. I don't have any sound chips. Let's see what it does without the card. Maybe it works now? I don't know. No, it doesn't. So here's the other diagnostic card. And it's running up to a point. So the PLA seems to be okay. Which is a good sign. Interrupts. The drops are me? <laughs> Am I? Ah, so there's still something wrong there. Okay, here's the same test on a good Commodore 64. <laughs> Okay, so the board remains a head scratcher. Uh, the next little thing I want to try to replace is this, which is a 4066 um, quadruple analog switch, which can be used for a lot of different things. I think in this case it's a buffer. Um, 
So, yeah, the, the levels on this one were not quite TTL, they're a bit low on some pins, so this might be the only thing left that's faulty on this. There's of course, there's a lot of, lot of small components that could be faulty. Um, the ICs, I nearly replaced all of them. There's another 4066 here, uh, which maybe but this the levels on this were not present at all because i think that's just uh, for the keyboard input uh, as far as i can tell so it, it only will will have signals if you type on the keyboard which is not connected in this case um i'm going to try to replace this one with a salvaged one you can get these for really cheap from everywhere but i don't want to wait and i don't have any in stock so i just salvaged one from my uh, spares board <clears throat> and I'm going to put in a socket and uh, try if this helps any we're so so close <laughs> So I think of every single chip I replace as the one uh, that will fix this. So I'm making a little glamour shots of everything. But uh, yeah, actually there's there's so many faults in this board that this might be one step further. Okay, let's see what the diagnostics says. Okay, at least it still starts up. Let's see if it passes the, the little test there. Nope. Same fault. Okay. <clears throat> so, back again with the Aldi Commodore 64, which has remained a head scratcher for me up to now. And as you can see, I have something new connected to it. Um, Sven, one of my viewers, uh, donated a little uh, harness that goes with the diagnostics card I'm using. Um, the 586220 diagnostic, which is the standard um, Commodore diagnostic for the C64. Uh, it comes. It came with the, with the harness when it was used by um, repair uh, persons back in the day. And um, Sven remade like little PCBs he designed and uh, made me the cables, which is I'm, I'm kind of ashamed a bit because I wanted, uh, I was meaning to do this myself at some point, build my own uh, test harness for the Commodore 64 because I usually would need it and I, I've never uh, gotten to actually build one. So thank you Sven for donating this and um, I'm going to link his GitHub. He made this all open source, the... Um, little um, PCB designs and stuff. Um, I'll link the GitHub down below. This is a really neat design and uh, I think it's pretty pretty much um, a very straightforward build. It's all nicely labeled and stuff so very very well done. Um, nice jobs. Thanks for giving this to me. Uh, let's see what we get with the um, test harness uh, connected. By the way off camera I checked the kernel. This is perfectly okay, it worked on another machine. Uh, I... Yeah, that's basically what I did off-camera. Let's see what the um, diagnostics says with the harness connected. Okay, so this looks just as promising as the last time we used this without the... Okay, it says the processor is bad. Cassette is bad. Keyboard. Control ports, the user port. Okay, so there's some issue with uh, the CIAs, it seems. It says it reports uh, 6510, which is the CPU, as bad. Both the CIA chips are bad, or rather, at, at, <laughs> in this case. Ah, which is interesting because um, M and O. So this should be okay. Yeah, the characters are like one or two bits off, which is interesting. 
the B is like the the ad is like two um two codes away two numbers the number of the letter at is like two numbers away from the B which it should be which is interesting the M is like two before the O it should be L M N uh <laughs> oh I can't really do the alphabet r backwards <laughs> J L M N okay the M or whatever it is is pretty much off there's something going on there but I can't quite pinpoint what it is. Mm. I posted this picture on Twitter and people uh, said I should just uh, basically clean the control ports, uh, the, the user port and the maybe the data set port. So yeah, I think I should just do that. Wow, these connectors are pretty tight because they are brand new. <laughs> And I'm using like a, an eraser, a pencil eraser, which works pretty well. So this stuff acts as a mild abrasive, I guess. So you get the crust off there. And afterwards you have to clean away the uh, like remnants, of course, obviously. Okay, I reconnected the harness after cleaning the ports. Let's see if it does any good. By the way, the RAM test is not very conclusive as it only tests uh, portions of the RAM. Uh, so it might still be like combined issues. So the cassette shows is bad, which is that's pretty bad. So the processor is more or less directly responsible for the dataset port. The interrupt, I think, could have also could also have something to do with the processor. So maybe there's something wrong with the processor there. Ah. Yeah. Now it doesn't show. <laughs> it doesn't show anything. Uh, at the interrupt stage there, where we still get the reading. Oh, okay, that's interesting. That's a different reading, actually. Okay. So the U2 doesn't show us bad anymore. The processor does. The SID is it's okay to be bad because there's no SID in there. So the 6510, so it might be kind of an intermittent uh, intermittent issue here. So U1 shows us bad, which is the right one of the CIA chips. So I should probably put another one in there and check the connections. Mm. I'm just wiggling the board around and starting this diagnostic over. Maybe it's it's like a like an intermittent fault for like a contact issue with uh, some components on the board or something. Just holding down on the CIA U1 now. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, U1 is bad. But U2 now seems to be okay for some reason. That's interesting. So the cassette and the control ports Bad. The processor shows us bad. And U1 shows us bad. Okay. <clears throat> so I think I'm just going to put in a known good uh, CAA to U1. See if that changes anything. So and while I'm at it, I'm also going to put another CPU in there. Okay, that's interesting. No, it's not. It's the exact same, isn't it? Yes, it's the exact same. So we get uh, bad still 
cassette port, control port, interrupt doesn't show up, 6510 shows as bad, 6526 U1 shows as bad, hmm, yeah, so I'm pretty much out of ideas at the moment, uh, it might just be that it's another one of those uh, buffer chips, there's another one of those uh, D4066 um, chips down there that buffers signals from the CAA or to for, from and to the CAA I guess um, yeah that might be faulty as well well this one it's warm at least yeah, I'm pretty much out of ideas at this point. I, um, I'm going to replace this one as a last resort kind of thing. And then I'm just going to... Uh, if that doesn't do anything, I'm just going to ask the hive mind of the YouTube commenters uh, to share their ideas. Uh, and maybe help me get through this like, like I, they did with the Commodore 128 repair I did. Uh, which turned out to be a very basic fault in the end, but uh, this might as well, I'm just not seeing it, so maybe if you saw something, just put it in the comments below. Uh, just going to replace this chip here to see. If that helps, maybe that's the fault. So let's try what it says without the little uh, buffer chip in there and the test harness. <laughs> Might be interesting to see. Maybe it even tells me something about the state of things. Let's see. Let's see if it does anything differently. This is probably just for the keyboard controller, the little buffer for the keyboard. Okay. Yeah, that's the same as before. So it might just be this little chip was at fault. Let's put in a another one. I don't know if it's a good one. It's a salvaged one because I don't have any of these in stock. Let's see what it does now. Maybe that's a different thing. Okay, it's just, it's it is exactly the same. And I um, resoldered some solder joints and stuff like that in the in the process. So hmm. I'm officially out of ideas for this video. So yeah, uh, I'm out of ideas. As you can see, I couldn't get this to fully work, but at least I got it to work to an extent and I can see um, the diagnostic, which doesn't really help at this point because, uh, yeah, I think what's remaining to do is to check like all the connections on the CAA and the CPU. Maybe you recheck the PLA. That's something I didn't check the PLA that I bought off eBay, um, the new one or new old stock one. I didn't check that, obviously, because I didn't want to go through the trouble of desoldering one of these uh, 64 lag chips from a working Commodore 64. Uh, yeah, so um, maybe that's faulty. But it reports as okay in the diagnostics, so I suppose the PLA is kind of okay. Uh, yeah, if you have any ideas, feel free to post them in the comments. This video has been long enough, I guess. Um, if you want to support my work, check out my little Patreon page that I am going to link here and in the end screen. And also check out the links in the description. There's always interesting stuff going on there. And I'm going to link all uh, tools and some troubleshooting guides I regularly use to troubleshoot Commodore 64s. Sorry I couldn't get this to work fully. Uh, yeah. So much for now. Thank you so much for watching. Hope to see you again on this channel sometime. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. So at least I can use this to play, uh, kind of play, Wizard of War. It looks uh, it's like the Ultimax 
the Max Machine version of Wizard of War. And it seems to work. To an extent, at least. This is so promising, but I don't don't really see how I can... And this is behaving oddly, so there's some things wrong there. I don't know. This is pretty strange. Uh, but this kind of works, and it's so we're so close. Hmm. See you next time.